This episode of The History Guy brought to you by World of Warships. While the discussion of the naval component of the Great War tends to focus on the British Grand Fleet and the German High Seas Fleet, the bottom line is those two fleets largely kept each other tied down, meaning that most of the interesting naval battles occurred elsewhere. Among those, the largest naval battle of the First World War to be fought in the Pacific, the Battle of Coronel, fought off the coast of Chile, far from the European battlefields. There the first British naval defeat in more than a century came to define the meaning of the term sacrifice, and to exemplify the meaning of the term Pyrrhic victory. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The warships of the First World War are just spectacular vessels. It really was the time of the great ships. And that's one of the reasons that I enjoy the free-to-play game World of Warships, which is now available on PC. One of the best parts of the game is that you get to play actual historic vessels like the SMS Dresden and HMS Weymouth, a town class like cruiser similar to HMS Glasgow, two of the ships that participated in the Battle of Coronel. Rendered in accurate and loving detail, the game offers a virtual floating digital museum for people who appreciate naval history, just like me. The game includes breathtaking recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. Not just cruisers, but also battleships and destroyers, aircraft carriers, and submarines. Each not just historically important and interesting, but also which offer unique challenges and advantages in fast, exciting, strategic gameplay. Since launch, World of Warships has added over 500 playable ships from 10 different nations. New content is released each month. Each week there's something new to experience with a steady cadence of new missions and game updates and events to keep you and your friends engaged for hours on end. And did I mention the game is also available on console? As an avid player myself, I really enjoy the perfect mix of strategy and action in World of Warships. So download the game today using the link in the description. And if you are a new player, use the code WARSHIPS and you'll get free doubloons, free credits, free premium playtime, and even a free ship after you complete... 15 battles. While I think most history buffs are quite familiar with the Pacific Theater during the Second World War, the Pacific Theater during the First World War seems to be discussed much less, despite spirited land and naval campaigns. These campaigns largely centered around the German and all those smaller Austro-Hungarian possessions in the Far East, and central to defending these was the German East Asia Squadron. Germany came in many ways rather late to the colonial game. While there were some early attempts at establishing colonies, efforts largely came to little. Part of the issue was that while other European powers were building empires, Germany did not exist as a state. While the German Confederation was created by the Congress of Vienna in 1815 to replace the collapsed Holy Roman Empire, there was simply no political Germany that existed to create a colonial empire. As late as 1866, the New York Times wrote, There is, in political geography, no Germany to speak of. There are kingdoms and grand duchies and duchies and principalities inhabited by Germans and each separately ruled by an independent sovereign with all the machinery of state. But that was about to change. The same month that the Times wrote that story, Prussian forces defeated Austria in the Austro-Prussian War, precipitating the dissolution of the German Confederation and the establishment of a closer and more federal North German Confederation. While the North German Confederation was better situated to manage a colonial empire, by its constitution colonization was under the oversight of the Confederation, in practice the most powerful driving force behind the Confederation, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, was very much opposed, arguing in a letter in 1868. On the one hand, the benefits which one might derive from colonies for the motherland's trade and industry are mostly illusory. Then the cost which the foundation, maintenance, and especially the establishment of claims to colonies entail very often exceed the utility with which the motherland gets from them. Without Bismarck's support, colonial ventures were limited. That's not to say there was no interest. The German Navy established a presence to protect trade in East Asia in 1861, and in 1868 the Confederation purchased land in Japan where it established a naval hospital that would become the East Asia Station, the Confederation's first permanent overseas base. The North German Confederation became the German Empire in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War, but Bismarck still held sway and still opposed establishing colonies. But he relented in the 1880s, finally seeing a colonial empire as necessary to protect trade and an essential part of the effort to establish the empire as a world power. 
the Germans began to use gunboat diplomacy to establish colonies throughout Africa and in the Far East with German New Guinea. Throughout the 1880s, Germany made many colonial acquisitions, mainly in Africa, but also in the Far East, including more islands around New Guinea, as well as parts of Samoa, islands in the Marshall and Solomon chains, and the island of Nauru. No major naval force was committed to the Far East until after the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894. Recognizing the extent of their interest in China, the empire established for the first time an East Asia Cruiser Division. However, Germany lacked a substantial naval base in the Pacific. Their new division required the help of friendly nations, Japan, Great Britain, and China, for logistical support. German ambassador to China Clemens von Kettler wrote to the Kaiser, Our ships cannot swim about here forever, like homeless waifs. To remedy the situation, the German government used an incident in which three German missionaries were killed as an excuse to occupy and force the Qing Empire to concede a 99-year lease for a fortified port called Tsingtao. Germany finally had a naval base and a substantial cruiser squadron in the Pacific. Still, Germany had successfully navigated European politics, despite conflicts over territories, including with the United States over Samoa. Germany was part of the Eight Nation Alliance during the 1899-1901 Boxer Rebellion and played a significant role in the taking of the Taku Forts. But Germany's position on the world stage was changing. Bismarck had been forced from office in 1890 with the new king, Kaiser Wilhelm II, preferring a more vigorous foreign policy. The Imperial Navy underwent a massive expansion under the auspices of Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, but the ambitions of the new Kaiser came at a cost, antagonizing former friends, especially Britain, which in 1902 concluded an alliance with Japan largely intended to curb German ambitions in the Pacific. Feeling the threat, France and Russia formed the Tripartite Alliance with Britain, further isolating the German Empire. Encyclopedia Britannica writes, The more established powers found Germany meddling everywhere. This behavior was partially striking because it followed two decades of Bismarck's policy of avoiding conflict. The Japanese objected to Germany's involvement in China in the 1890s. Russia watched as German power and influence grew in Turkey, its hereditary enemy. The French, of course, still harbored dreams of undoing their defeat in 1870. With Britain also alienated, Bismarck's nightmare of a coalition against the young upstart empire had become a reality. When war came in 1914, Germany found itself with powerful enemies on two sides. But the situation in the Far East was even worse. The German East Asia Squadron was isolated and without allies. While the growth of the Imperial Navy had benefited the East Asia Squadron, by 1914 the squadron included a substantial force of five modern cruisers as well as several smaller vessels. That squadron, its commander, Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spee knew, was no match for their foes in the region. Despite its five modern cruisers, the squadron held no capital ships, battleships, or battle cruisers, the two largest vessels being protected cruisers. Not only was Spee's fleet vulnerable to the Royal Navy, but also the Royal Australian Navy, whose flagship, the battlecruiser HMAS Australia, Spee described as able to defeat his entire fleet, and potentially the Imperial Japanese Navy as well. The Falklands Island Association explains Spee's situation at the outset of the war. The outbreak of the war saw the German East Asia Cruiser Squadron under Vice Admiral Maximilian Graf von Spee at sea in the Pacific. Rather than return to his base in Tsingtao in China, where we could have been vulnerable to Allied attack, von Spee decided to move towards the Chilean coast to disrupt British and Allied commercial shipping. Spee was not optimistic about his future, writing, I am quite homeless. I cannot reach Germany. We possess no other secure harbor. I must plow the seas of the world, doing as much mischief as I can, until my ammunition is exhausted, or a foe far superior in power succeeds in catching me. But the website BritishBattles.com notes Spee had an advantage. On the declaration of war on 3rd August 1914, the Royal Navy did not know where Spee's squadron was. Tracking down and destroying the individual German commerce raiders and cruisers in the vast area of the Indian and Pacific Oceans was enough of a problem. The presence somewhere at sea of Spee's powerful squadron was altogether of a different magnitude. Spee gathered his squadron off the Mariana Islands in the northwest Pacific, and there he dispatched the light cruiser SMS Emden to conduct commerce raiding in the Indian Ocean. The voyage of the Emden is the subject of another episode of The History Guy. Spee began raiding in the Pacific, attacking shipping and bombarding the French Polynesian island of Papite. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy collected assets intended to intercept and destroy Spee's squadron. The website Thoughtco explains, 
Alerted to von Spee's presence, the British Royal Navy began making plans to intercept and destroy his squadron. The closest force in the area was Rear Admiral Christopher Craddock's West Indies Squadron, consisting of the older armored cruisers HMS Good Hope and HMS Monmouth, as well as the modern light cruiser HMS Glasgow and the converted liner HMS Otranto. The problem was that Craddock's fleet was no match for Spee. While the modern protected cruisers Nisenau and Scharnhorst had veteran hand-picked crews and received awards in gunnery, Craddock's crews were mostly green recruits and reservists. While Good Hope mounted two 9.2-inch naval guns and two turrets, most of her guns, and all of those of HMS Monmouth, were 6-inch guns, most mounted in casemates that made them difficult to fire, especially in high seas. By contrast, Nisenau and Scharnhorst each carried eight 8.2-inch guns. Spee's fleet had a significant advantage in range and firepower. To even the odds, the Admiralty dispatched the pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Canopus from the Cape Verde Islands, in order, BritishBattles.com notes, to give Craddock a ship of force. At 421 feet long, Canopus was three times as large as either of Spee's protected cruisers and mounted four 12-inch guns. But there was difficulty with HMS Canopus, a ship which historian William Edmondson noted in his 2009 book, A History of the British Presence in Chile, had been built in 1899 and destined for the scrapyard in 1915, had it not been for the war. British Battles explains, Preparing to move north from the Straits of Magellan, Craddock faced a considerable problem in HMS Canopus. The aged battleship was intended by the Admiralty to provide Craddock with the heavy guns needed to combat the two German armored cruisers, Scharnhorst and Nisenau. Canopus arrived in the Falklands on 22nd October 1914, a week late, in a bad state, and required three days of repairs. Even then, she could only achieve around 14 knots, which was inadequate to keep up with the rest of Craddock's squadron, of which the slowest was Otranto, with 18 knots, and the rest of the ships being capable of around 24 knots. This created a significant problem for Craddock, British Battles explains. Without Canopus's 12-inch guns, Craddock had no gun to compare with the armament of Scharnhorst and Nisenau while with Canopus, his squadron would be too slow to catch the German squadron. Faced with the difficulty, Craddock made a difficult choice. He left Canopus behind to guard his colliers and proceeded with the rest of his fleet through the Straits of Magellan. It is unclear why Craddock made this decision, as his fleet without Canopus was no match for Spee. British Battles writes that Craddock appears to have considered the Admiralty's instruction to him to search and protect trade in order to fight Spee, whatever the consequences. The meeting of the two fleets came by coincidence. Craddock had sent his light cruiser HMS Glasgow to the Chilean port of Cornell to send a message to the Admiralty. On the way, Glasgow intercepted radio messages that suggested that the light cruiser SMS Leipzig was nearby. Craddock brought Good Hope, Monmouth, and Otranto north, while Spee, hearing about Glasgow's presence at Cornell, brought his squadron south. At this point, the intentions of both admirals is unclear. It's possible that each thought that they were intercepting a single ship, with Craddock hoping to catch Leipzig before it could join with Spee, and Spee hoping to catch Glasgow, not knowing that Craddock was in the area. That is, the fleets might have met by accident. But it is also possible that Craddock, thinking his orders were to confront Spee regardless of cost, chose the battle despite knowing that his fleet was outmatched. There was reason for his concern. On August 8th, the fleet under the command of Admiral Ernest Trowbridge had failed to engage two German battlecruisers in the Mediterranean, as the German ships had larger guns with better range. The two battlecruisers had escaped, and Trowbridge faced court-martial. British Battles writes, On departing from Port Stanley in the Falklands, Craddock left a letter to be forwarded to his friend Admiral Hedworth Mew in the event of his death, stating that he did not intend to suffer the fate of Rear Admiral Ernst Trowbridge. In any case, Leipzig was not alone, but had joined with Spee, who now had, in addition to Nisenau and Scharnhorst, the light cruisers Dresden, Nuremberg, and Leipzig. With Canopus some 350 miles away, Craddock was sailing into a calamitous mismatch. The battle fought off the coast of Chile on November 1, 1914, was a disaster for the British squadron. The Halifax, Nova Scotia Evening Mail reported on November 4, in the most important naval battle of the war between European powers, a German fleet engaged the British squadron, composed of the Good Hope, Monmouth, and Glasgow, and decisively defeated it. That the British cruisers gave brilliant battle was indicated by the loss that they suffered. The Monmouth continued to battle until her hull was riddled and she could hold no more water than a sieve. Those who had not been killed on board the Monmouth by the terrific fire to which she was subjected stood at their guns and fired shell after shell until the cruiser toppled over in the water. 
lay for a moment with her keel being lapped by the seas, and then plunged to the bottom. The Derby Evening Telegraph reported that after the Monmouth disappeared, the German cruisers closed in on the Good Hope, the big guns of the two battle cruisers firing with marvelous accuracy, with flames bursting from her in a dozen places, her superstructure carried away and her guns out of commission. The Good Hope finally turned and ran ashore. She could be seen settling in the water. At the time those reports were published, the fate of Good Hope and Admiral Craddock was unclear. But in fact, Good Hope had been lost. And as with Monmouth, with all hands, including Rear Admiral Craddock, the rough seas making any lowering of boats impossible. In all, 1,660 officers and men of the Royal Navy perished in the battle. Glasgow, though damaged, had escaped in the night, and Otranto, nothing more than a passenger ship that had been outfitted with a few guns, had been ordered to run at the start of the battle. Spee's fleet was virtually undamaged, having had just six men wounded. Edmondson writes, The unthinkable happened. Rule Britannia was roundly defeated in this battle, and the pride and reputation of the Royal Navy, which had ruled the ways for two centuries, lay shattered in Chilean waters. The Battle of Coronel was the largest naval battle to have been fought at that point in the war and the first British naval defeat since the War of 1812. The question is, why did Craddock engage with the fleet knowing that his was outmatched? Perhaps he was simply caught off guard by the arrival of Spee and unable to run away, as that would have meant abandoning the slower HMS Otranto to Spee. First Lord of the Navy Winston Churchill told the Parliament that he decided to attack in the belief that even if he himself were destroyed, that he would inflict damage upon them, which would ensure their certain subsequent destruction. Despite the victory, Spee was in no mood to celebrate. In the battle, his fleet had expended nearly half their ammunition, with no hope of resupply. He was far from home, and his enemies were hunting him. When he was handed a bouquet of flowers at a victory celebration in the port of Valparaiso, he said, these will do nicely, for my grave. In that he was correct. Spee and his fleet would be destroyed by the Royal Navy just over a month later in the Battle of the Falkland Islands. Nearly 1,900 Germans would perish in the battle, including Vice Admiral Spee. Edmondson noted, Of every ten officers and sailors who faced each other at Coronel on that day of all saints, nine were to die in the war. If Craddock sending his fleet to certain deaths seemed senseless, it was almost as senseless that Spee was there at all. Encyclopedia Britannica notes that the German efforts to create a global empire proved to be a colossal failure. Because Germany came so late to the colonial game, all the choicest territories had already been occupied. Or, in other words, the German territories in the Pacific were of little economic value and never paid off their own cost. Spee and his fleet had been left so far from home to defend an empire that was built on vanity alone. And that empire was quickly taken by the Australians and the Japanese without Spee being able to do anything about it. Remember, download World of Warships using the link in the description. Use the promo code WARSHIPS to get free to blues, credits, premium playtime, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guide. If you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guide with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guide as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guide on Cameo.